It is now recording. All right. Let's go ahead over here real quick. Thanks, cameraman Jared. I appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, we have actually quite a few people on Zoom as well. Um, thank you for, for coming both either in person or on the Zoom meeting. Um, I'm Michael Buford. I'm the vice president of the society. And with me, we have previous president, uh, past president, um, Tom Burleson, who's going to be telling us a little bit about a telescope that he found found somewhere on the, on internet. the internet. On the internet. Um, before we start off with our presentation, so I'm going to hand it over to Tom, and then we'll go to the real press uh, to the full presentation. Uh, this is not my telescope. This telescope belongs to the society. I'm donating it. This telescope is a 70 millimeter Maxitop Cassegrain made in the late 1940s. Uh, Dimitri was born in, let's see, 1890 something, 19, 1896, I think it was. And spent a lot of early years building his own telescopes. Came up with a great design with a meniscus lens. And you'll see this in all these Maxitop telescopes with a lens in the front that's concave on the front side and convex on the back side. This is a corrector. For the lens for the mirror at the back. This one's a Maxitoff Cassegrain because like that goes in, bounces up, and comes back out the back. They have Maxitoff Newtonians and Maxitoff several other different different varieties. A lot of them are available today. The ETX 90 is a Maxitoff. Uh, the society was just donated a six-inch Maxitoff Cassegrain. It's sitting over in the, in the storage room right now. There's a lot of people using the Maxitoff design. This one I purchased on the eBay from a guy in Kiev. And he sold it to me and shipped it over. Uh, these were made in the late 1940s in St. Petersburg. At that time it was called Leningrad. And under the supervision of Maxitoff himself. He, I, he probably never laid hands on this one, but he was there and they were making them in the city under his supervision. They made thousands of them. They were making them for schools and universities all, the way, all across the Soviet Union. So we now have one of the original Maxutov telescopes. Let's see, was there anything else I wanted to say about it? Oh, if you uh, Google Dmitry Maxutov, you will find a photograph of him. And here's, this is what the photograph looks like. You won't be able to see it at home. But there's a photograph of him with a telescope like that one sitting on the desk behind him. So this one will go on display in our display case here as soon as kind of crook does the update on the display. Real quick, can we show the camera? Yeah, drag it up there close. Help me out here, Jared. Lower, lower, there you go. The thing weighs about 25 pounds. It's pretty, it's, it's, made, pretty it's made out of steel. Russian Very steel. Steel. And this is a number 1863 from 1946. Pretty cool. I think so. That's very cool. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, we'll put this back for a moment. Okay. Um, we have a couple of board members here. Does anybody have anything that they wanted to say? Frank, is everything is anything broken? No. Nope. nope. Don, is anything broken? No, I'm good. Jared, is anything broken? Nope. Michael, is there anything broken? I don't think so. We got people here. That's all I, that's my responsibility. So I'm going to read off a lovely resume sent to me by our, by, by our presenter here. So Ed Fates was born in Southwick, Massachusetts. Um, he saw his first lunar eclipse in 1963 as a nine-year-old and has been an amateur astronomer ever since. He's a past member of the Houston, uh, Texas Astronomical Society. Uh, current member and past president of the Springfield, Massachusetts Stars Club, founding director and former president of Aruna Hill, a dark sky site in Berkshires of Western Massachusetts, frequent attendee and occasional speaker at Stella Fane in Springfield, uh, Springfield, Vermont. Vermont. Okay, I'm not used to the VT. I forgot which one. Uh, recently retired SQL programmer and DBA, avid but terrible on his own account, not mine both disc and ball variety golf. 
Uh, and he tries to keep uh, keep up with his wife on bicycles, and she usually leaves him in the dust. So um, we're actually going to turn the camera around, so, but please give it a round, uh, round of applause for Ed Bates. Okay, so let me show you. Uh, this is a little behind the scenes. Oops. <laughs> um, so Let's just shrink everything. In. Yeah, but you want to keep one thing open. Um, Share. Yes, we need to do the share screen first. Do share screen, and you want to do um, this one. This one, screen two, and you want the chat right here. So if anybody has any questions, it'll pop up right here for okay. you. Okay. So go. Great. You are you are free. As, as Michael mentioned, uh, I occasionally attend Stellafane, and the Maksutovs are legendary telescopes. They're very well corrected, edge to edge. And back in the 50s and 60s, there was a splinter group that would go to Stellafane, Vermont every summer, and they were the Maksutov Club. And to join the Maksutov Club, you had to make a Maksutov. And there were a total of 10 people that made it into the Maksutov Club. And they were all legends when I first started going to Stellafane. They were still around. I think they're pretty much all gone now. Um, but they're beautiful telescopes. Great to see that. <clears throat> so we had a little discussion. I, I know somebody has heard of, uh, of Alvin Clark. Um, I assume some of the people have, may have heard of Henry Fitz. And no one at all in here has heard of Amasa Holcomb before. Okay, um, I had never heard of him either. Um, when I first started, became involved with the Houston Astronomical Society and bought my first telescope, I started reading everything I could about telescopes. And this guy came up as a footnote and he was from Southwick, Massachusetts, which is basically where I am from. And I, I had never heard of him. And he was the first commercial telescope maker um, in North America. And I kind of put that in the back of my mind, but when I moved, had kids and moved back up to Southwick, Massachusetts, I, I started to do a little research and uh, found out a little bit about his life. So I'd like to share some of that with you today. He was born in 1787, died in 1875, well into his 80s. Um, did a lot of things in life. Um, we'll get on to that. But now I figured out how to advance the slides. Southwick, Massachusetts, um, it's a fairly small town, kind of nestled between Hartford, Connecticut, and Springfield, Massachusetts. Uh, now about 10,000 people. And there are two famous people to have ever come out of Southwick, Massachusetts. The first was our hero, the telescope maker. Amasa Holcomb, and you can see by the picture on the right, just a real pleasant looking guy. Um, and the other one was a, is a sweetheart. It's uh, Rebecca Lobo, who led the University of Connecticut to an um, NCAA Women's National Championship um, and is now a commentator for ESPN. Those are the only two, if you, if you Wikipedia Southwick, Massachusetts, you're the same as people, those are the two people that come up. And of course the town, values one over the other. If I can do this correctly. <laughs> so if you drive to our library, you drive on Rebecca Lobo Way. Nowhere in town do you see any reference to Amos Hokum. The great, great, great granddaughter spent an afternoon correcting me when I'd say Amos Hokum. She'd say it was Amos or Ama Holcomb. Looks like Amasa to me, but apparently the pronunciation back in 1790 was more like Amos or Amasa. But I'll say Amasa the whole night. Uh, so again, when I, I, I started seeing um, Holcomb's name in a couple places, and the first one was uh, in uh, the June uh, 86 Sky and Telescope. Oh, I have to be on camera. Okay. Uh, 
in June 86, uh, Sky and Telescope, there was an article, a three page article about first commercial telescope maker, Amos Holcomb. And it was kind of a rehash of the article in the middle, which was a Smithsonian publication that came out um, what, in the 1930s. And Holcomb, Fitz, and Piatti, heard it pronounced Pete or Piatti, three 19th century American telescope makers. It was issued by the Smithsonian as a, um, one of their quarterly bulletins. And it had a four page autobiography of Emma Holcomb written when he was obviously in his 80s. And it was written in real stilted formal text. And he always did everything in the third person. He was like an NBA basketball star. Everything was in the third person about Emma Holcomb made this and did this and did this. And there's a recap of his life. Um, and then the third place would show up in the classic history of the telescope, King's History of the Telescope, which is still, you know, still in print. Um, but for a long time, it was absolutely the reference, the history of the telescope. Holcomb's name is not mentioned, but uh, like on page 129, there's a little footnote that said, you know, in 1830, A. Holcomb of Southwick, Massachusetts made the largest telescope in North America at the time. So, so he had known a little bit. Um, so as you drive into Southwick, Massachusetts from Connecticut, you get greeted with a sign of entering the Pioneer Valley. Western Massachusetts is not Boston. Um, it's, it's, it's not like New York. It's, it's kind of a more rural, more independent, a uh, little wilder uh, part of the state, even to this day, kind of, Amherst area is known in Northampton for kind of remnant hippie culture. Um, and it's no coincidence that Shays Rebellion, the first great rebellion, political rebellion uh, in George Washington's time uh, took place in Western Massachusetts. But it's also the home of many things. Many things were invented uh, in Western Massachusetts, seemed to generate a lot of ideas and businesses. Um, two great sports that I gave my knees to uh, volleyball and basketball were both invented in Western Massachusetts. So when we think of pioneers, Amos Holcomb fits right in in the pioneering spirit. He was a teacher, a farmer, a surveyor, a political figure, a civil engineer, a tinkerer, a thinker, and through all that became the first commercial telescope maker in North America. Um, had a pretty interesting long life. So if you look at a map of Massachusetts, where is Southwick, Massachusetts? And I do have that pointer, right? I can click. You see a weird part of the state where most of the state follows the 42nd parallel, but there's a little part that sticks out in the Connecticut. Um, and that, that is where Amos Holcomb spent his entire life. He writes in his biography that he lived in four towns in two states and never moved. Um, and what had happened was um, Springfield, Massachusetts is right about here. Hartford, Connecticut is right down there. The Connecticut River runs right through this part. And Ships would come into New Haven, Connecticut, Goldstein going ships to New Haven, Connecticut, and they could navigate up the Connecticut River as far as the Enfield Rapids, which are right, right about where I have my dot here, the Enfield Rapids, which meant if you were a farmer or you were raising sheep and creating wool, you had access to worldwide markets if you lived in Enfield, below the Enfield Rapids. If you were north of that, it was much more difficult because you had to cart everything down to Enfield or Hartford, put it on the long boats and get it down, shipped off. So both Massachusetts and Connecticut coveted the wealthy towns that developed along the Enfield Rapids, uh, Suffield, Connecticut and Enfield, Connecticut. However, both of those small towns were settled out of Springfield, Massachusetts, and the churches in those two towns reported to the Bishop of Springfield. 
So Massachusetts had a strong claim on those wealthy towns, but so did Connecticut. Connecticut was, hey, everything south of the 42nd parallel is ours. And the dispute lasted for years and years and years. And as a consequence, uh, this part of Massachusetts over here was kind of considered no man's land. Nobody invested in schools, no one claimed it, no one developed any infrastructure there. That's where Amos Holcomb lived. So he didn't, didn't get the benefit of any schooling. So finally, two stories going on at one time, but um, in 1802, Thomas Jefferson said, hey, you gotta resolve this thing. We're gonna send envoys. We're gonna, we're gonna diplomatically resolve this issue uh, of Enfield and Suffield, who does it go to? And the lawyers got together and the politicians got together and they resolved that Enfield and Suffield to this day are part of Connecticut, not Massachusetts. But as a consolation prize, Massachusetts gets the wilderness land to the west. And that's the jog here. That's the jog that sticks down into Connecticut. It's considered wilderness. Hardly anybody lived there, but Amos Holcomb and his family did. So he had no schooling, no education. He had to go 20 miles to church up in Westfield or down in the Simsbury, Connecticut. There was nothing and there was no incentive to settle it because it was claimed by two states and really claimed by nobody. Um, so with no education, he got a break in life. His father was a Revolutionary War soldier who got some land. He was a, you know, kind of a, a, a dirt farmer growing sheep, raising some crops there in Southwick where the, the soil is pretty rich. Um, and he had an uncle, Eb Ebediza, who did what all New Englanders do to go off and get rich. He was an educated guy. He went to Nantucket and signed on as a whaling ship as the navigator because he had some science education and he could go out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and look at the North Star and figure out where they were and navigate around. Very, um, two people got wealthy on the ships. The captains made tons of money. The navigator got well paid. The first mates got paid pretty well and everybody else didn't do so well, but compared to being a farmer, if, if you survived a whaling voyage, you came back with money in your pocket. So Amos' uncle went off and never came back. Wasn't unusual, those whaling ships was very dangerous business. His uncle never came back. Um, but Amos inherited all of his books. His uncle was a learned man, which Amos had no opportunity to do in Southwick, Massachusetts. So he became self-taught. By the age of 15, he absorbed all of his uncle's books to the point where there's a private school in, to this day, the, the, the school remains uh, um, in Suffield, Connecticut, Suffield Academy, which is academically um, renowned school, high school, private school. And uh, as a 15 year old self-taught, he was teaching astronomy, math, and navigation to the kids that were paying big bucks to go to uh, Suffield Academy. So it, it, this guy just had a um, ability, intellectual capacity and, and curiosity for life. So even though he grew up in the hinterlands, the wilderness, um, he, he was able to develop uh, develop his mind and, and do some amazing things. So, you know, we're, we're many years later, right? All this political stuff was resolved in 1802. There, no, there's no bad feeling still about the land border, except it's about 15 years ago when Granby, Connecticut put their new firehouse in, they chose to name it Lost Acres Fire Department because those acres that we saw that went to Massachusetts, they're still complaining about. And if you do a Google search, this is actually a thing. I think it's a joke, but maybe it isn't. I don't know. In the political climate we're in, it might not be a joke. Take back the notch, make Connecticut whole. This is an actual page. And a guy, I think it's tongue in cheek, has a long thing about how Massachusetts stole the notch and Connecticut wants it back. So send them money and, uh, and uh, you can join the movement, I guess. I don't know.
I hope it's some good fun. Um, so one of the things I found out is young Amasa at age 18 wrote an almanac. Actually for two years, he wrote an almanac in uh, 1807 and 1808, he wrote and published an almanac. And in his little four page uh, bio that was at the Smithsonian, he writes, um, take some pains to res respectfully explain Nehemiah Strong's almanac is not accurate. He failed to predict the January 4th, 1806 eclipse. So Amasa was motivated by that, started publishing his own almanac. Now, I got a tip that he only published a few copies of this. They're very rare, they're pretty valuable, but the Beinecke Rare Book Library in New Haven had a copy. So one fine winter's day, I ventured down to New Haven with my kids, which was probably a mistake because they were six and eight at the time, I think. And we went to the Yale campus and the, the, the Rare Book Library is an amazing building. So the picture of it on the left, it's, it's just a stone um, outer shell. And on the inside, the books are in a big uh, sealed climate controlled glass case. And there's um, first edition Audubon um, bird books around. There's a Gutenberg, uh, rare Gu Gutenberg Bible in the place. It's, it's an amazing place. And I had made an appointment. I was going to go get the Holcomb Almanac and, and look at it. And you know, I had to wear white gloves and I couldn't bring in a pen. I can only bring in a pencil and notes. And you know, I just about got patted down. And uh, um, the story is, that inner building, the, the Yale undergraduates swear that the building is designed so in case of a fire or other problem, the books are saved and the undergraduates are killed. Um, and and I, think, I think there's only a little bit of truth to that. I, I think there's probably like a halon system or something that sucks all the air out, temp buzzes, gives you a warning to run out and then sucks the air out briefly to put out the fire. But uh, that's the story anyway that the, the, the books will be saved and the undergraduates are uh, expendable. Um, tell a story about Yale. Uh, both my kids applied to Yale, neither of them got in. Um, and we were on the tour many years later. And we're on the tour of Yale. Yale is learned place, a great reputation. And you know, we're, my wife and I are walking with the kids in a big group and the tour guides pointing out stuff. And my kids getting in a squabble. You know, they're like pushing each other, shoving each other, and kicking each other. And I turned to my wife and I said, "You think Barbara Bush had this problem with Jeb and uh, and W when they toured Yale?" And she said, yeah, "I bet they did. You know, they probably did." Um, but neither of my kids ended up getting in the Yale, but it's still a fabulous place. Okay. Um, so the almanac, the um, the 1807 one, I, I got to Yale. This one, um, just a few years ago, a friend of mine called and he said, uh, um, meet me at the Southwick Historical Society. You're going to like what I just bought. So I, I met him at a, you know, like a Sunday afternoon. I kind of had an idea what he was, what, what he was up to. And he kind of pulls out of his briefcase and, you know, he's got the gloves on and he, he shows me the 1808 almanac. Because the 1807 almanac is well documented in the Beinecke Library. This one had not been seen in public for years. And he found it. And I said, Lee, how much did you pay for it? And he smiled at me. He said, well, he said it was more of a barter. And he never told me what he bartered, but he's got this priceless, maybe one of a kind almanac um, that, he, that he bartered. Um, and it, it's a straightforward almanac. If you're, if you're familiar with the, the common almanac, uh, um, now it's the same kind of format, um, weather stuff, but he has little essays and jokes and poetry around uh, in both of them, especially the second one, the 1808 one. But this is a, a poem. And again, he wrote this at a 19 year old. He did all the calculations himself, I'm sure. Uh, maybe from, you know, books that he got out of the Boston or the Yale Library, uh, 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 ephemeris. Uh, 
but did all the calculations to make it local to Southwark. But the one that, um, the poem in the, uh, the 1807 almanac really strikes me as, as um, given it his intellect, the, the foresight he had, the, the vision. The poem goes, behold the moon in clouded state is seen and stars unnumbered wait around their queen. Ranged by their maker's hand in just array, they march uh, majestic through the ethereal way. Are these bright luminaries hung on high only to pre please with twinkle raise our eye? Or rather may we count each star a sun round which full peopled world their courses run. Orb above orb, harmoniously they steer their various voyages through seas of air. This is a 19 year old kid in 1807 talking about, well, yeah, we see the stars up there. They're really beautiful, but what are they? Are, are they stars? Are there planets? Are there other people around? And even with the professional astronomers at the time, that, that was a huge leap. It, there wasn't a lot of people thinking in those terms that, oh yeah, the, the stars are like our sun. And if they're like our sun, there's probably planets. And if there's planets, there's probably people. You know, and these aren't just there for the pleasure of our eyes. Um, that's our man, Amasa. Um, so the, the, the eclipse that Nehemiah Strong failed to predict in January 4th, I, I thought it must have been some kind of spectacular thing. And I knew in um, 1806, there had been a total eclipse that went right through New England. Actually, Holcomb describes seeing the eclipse and it being a big deal. Uh, kind of came in through Boston and uh, um, cut across uh, through like San Diego and touched, touched Mexico on the way out. There's a fairly famous widely seen eclipse, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a January 4th eclipse. And I, I did a little research and it was kind of a wimpy partial lunar eclipse. So I, I kind of give Nehemiah a little pass on that, but you know, Holcomb went to a lot of trouble. Uh, because Nehemiah missed it and, and Holcomb caught it. He saw it. Uh, so again, he was self-taught. He was a mathematician. Um, he started getting gigs around the area because he was learned, he was smart, he could do the math and the area was growing, you know, from rural wild land. Um, and he, he got a job as a surveying. He, he would get hired to do the surveying. Um, and he got frustrated because the instruments to buy were very expensive. They're all coming out of England or France um, and they were too expensive, but he had access to some skills. There were brass works up in Westfield, Massachusetts, up 10 miles away. Uh, there were starting to be brass works in um, Springfield and Hartford. And he, he had some skills on his own and he, he did a lot of reading. Um, and he started fabricating his own instruments. And this is a little surveyor's transit that he built um, that's in the Smithsonian now. Um, and let's see if I can find it. It's down here somewhere. There, he was a great surveyor. You know, his stuff was amazingly accurate. And um, this is from our town hall right now. But one of these roads out here has a little jog around a stream and it's mirror image. It's wrong. This map is wrong. When you go look at it or you go to Google Earth, it's wrong. And he was much too good of a surveyor to get that wrong. And the story was to protect his copyrights, he made that one error. So if anybody else did a map of Southwick, Massachusetts, he would just look at that street. If they got it wrong, he knew they didn't do their own survey. They had stole his stuff. Um, the story has been told and I've heard it told, well, yeah, you know, like every good surveyor kind of did that. So it's not all that unique, but I thought it was a great story. That, and, and actually, um, um, I'm involved with a little business right over here. <laughs> so I know, I know the road. Every time I go down it, I think, yeah, this is Holcomb's, Holcomb's road. Oh, there it is. There it is, right there, that bulge. I did put in a, I forgot I had done that. So in his 20s, 
Holcomb was a curious guy. Um, he was a noter of nature. He would do weather, follow the weather and make recordings of the weather. He would talk about his farming and you know what he planted and when the last frost was and when the rains were and that sort of thing. Um, he had a tremendous interest in the natural world. Um, we certainly have our fair of fair share of uh, coyotes and um, bear and that sort of thing coming through even today in, in our town. And he would note, you know, the animals that he saw and when he saw them. Um, but he got took a strong interest in astronomy. But he complained that there was no local glass of quality in the size that he wanted for an astronomical telescope. Getting glass from Europe took a long time. It was expensive. And even then, it was kind of a crapshoot if you got good optics or didn't get good optics. You'd have to order, you'd have to send off your money. And if it arrived, it was good, great. If it wasn't so good, I guess you could try to return it, but you wasted probably three years in the process. So his solution, he was going to fabricate his own because he could. He had woodworking skills, he had a little bit of glass skills from doing the, the transits and the surveying tools. And he had connections to get information was the big thing that he would be hooked into Harvard and Yale and get information. <clears throat> and he was a big follower of William Herschel. So he's going to fabricate his own. Couldn't get good glass, but there was a way around that. You could make a reflecting telescope. Uh, Herschel certainly did and did it successfully. And you did it with speculum. And you did speculum was one part tin, two parts copper. And according to Herschel, you put in a touch of arsenic. Arsenic, of course, is a poison. Um, and there's today people will argue that the arsenic does nothing to improve the durability, the re reflectivity or anything. But Herschel was convinced that his telescopes were better because he added a touch of arsenic. Um, and that's what Amos the Holcomb did. The problem with speculum is even beautifully polished, its reflectivity is 60%. Now, you know, modern aluminized, you know, with, with coatings, you get about 96%, I guess. Um, speculum got 60% when it was newly polished and it tarnished very quickly and very quickly depending on the weather conditions, might be a matter of weeks um, or at least a few months. Um, so what did you do about that lack of reflectivity? Well, what Herschel did with his Herschelian telescope was you eliminated a secondary mirror because you didn't want to lose 40% of the mirror, the reflect, the captured light in the speculum here and then lose 40% again at a secondary. So you just eliminated the secondary. And that's how uh, Holcomb made his mirror, his telescopes. And this is Herschel. And Herschel's favorite telescope was a backyard garden telescope, a wooden contraption with pulleys and levers and wheels um, that Herschel made amazing discoveries with, with his sister on. And Holcomb modeled that. Now, if you look at just a crude light tracing, uh, you know, what, what you basically did was, was you had a mirror you parabola, parabolized, maybe, um, and then you, you tilted it to an eyepiece that you put up here. Now, anybody who struggled with collimation with a big reflector knows what happens when, when you go off axis like that. You can introduce coma, you know, a lot of coma in this case. Um, but there was a trick of that. If you, if you made these things like F15, if you made really long focal lengths, you minimize the detrimental effects of coma of doing the, um, the tilted mirror. So um, there were a lot of sources that Holcomb would have had, and it, it, apparently he was directly in touch with Herschel. Um, but there are also a lot of publications that he could have gotten out of the libraries at Harvard, Harvard or Yale about how you grind it. But the grinding, a speculum. Making the speculum was a matter of the, the kind of um, brass works he did. You, you got uh, tin, copper, real hot. You mixed it all together. Um, maybe you added the arsenic carefully with a well-ventilated area. 
Now, what Herschel did by legend was to, to mold his mirrors, he would go to his kitchen table, he would put a bunch of horse manure down, he would use a scribe to make a round divot in the horse manure, and he would pour in the speculum, well ventilated because you didn't want to die arsenic poisoning, and you know, let it anneal, let it kind of cool in his kitchen um, until he had a mirror, and then he would begin the polishing process. I don't know if Holcomb ever used the horse manure trick. Um, there are probably other things he might have had available because he wasn't trying to make mirrors quite as large as what Herschel was making. He was generally kind of taking six and eight inch mirrors. Um, but, but that was the process. And the polishing of a speculum mirror isn't a whole lot different from the polishing of a, of a glass mirror now. You get, you get a tool, you get some grit, I happen to know with certainty that Holcomb had access to wonderful sand. We, we're we're um, glacier lake bottom in Southwick, Massachusetts. The whole thing is sand. He would initially um, ground it down with, with sand and then and, um, uh, move to emery later on to, to end up with the polish. So um, Herschel talks, Herschel's sister writes about him and the process for him, he would get started on grinding a speculum mirror and, and Herschel would do it pretty much nonstop for hours and hours and hours with, with his sister Caroline feeding him by hand and giving him drinks to sip while he never took his hands off the grinding process. It sounds a little apocryphal to me, you know, stop, take a break, go pee, you know, down 12 ounces of your favorite adult beverage and get back to grinding seems to be the thing. but. Um, and again, you know, um, Holcomb's only notes about it was he followed the techniques of Herschel. How closely he followed them, one can only imagine, given how creative he was and the fact that he was fabricating all of the surveying equipment, I suspect he kind of made his own processes um, that would have worked for him, but, but we have no record of, of what that would have been. So um, on the internet, you Google this guy and uh, he made a speculum mirror here just a few years ago. And this is what it started out like. Um, and this is after he polished it. You know, he's got his iPhone. So, you know, <laughs> this wasn't 1860 that this, this guy was doing it recently. Um, but you can get a reasonably good mirror out of speculum in about the same amount of time that you would out of a glass mirror. The problems were twofold. One is they tarnished really quickly. And two is even when they were good, you weren't getting a lot, you were losing a lot of light in the process. So this is the Smithsonian published um, of uh, Holcomb's telescope. Uh, the family donated this eight inch telescope to the Smithsonian. Um, and this is their official publicity picture. Again, the eyepiece is right up on the tube and you look down the tube and the tube of the telescope is one of the three legs of the tripod. It's uh, two wooden legs with some cord on it. And I wanna point out the bottom here. Um, there is a spike and a wheel, spike and a wheel. So if you're outside on the grass or on the dirt, the spike holds and then the wheel and you can, using these ropes and some little levers up here, you can actually get some slow motion tracking out of the thing. It's pretty ingenious um, and it's fairly steady using the tube as one of the legs, it, it really is. Now, I always wondered if you were a guy with big ears, did you get a diffraction spike out of your ear because your ear was kind of hanging over the tube? It's probably, could be a problem, I don't know. This is me many years ago, a little younger, and the, my hair is a kind of slightly different color. But um, I made arrangements to go to the Smithsonian. Um, I had a research grad student assigned to me for an afternoon. I had about a two-hour window where they took me into the basement and found me Holcomb's telescope. So I got to hold it. I got to examine it. I got to play with it for a day. It was a big thrill. Uh, and again, my kids were running a little older at that point and they were running around um, 
the mall while I was doing this with my wife. And I had a badge here and the badge was UV sensitive. So if I ever left and came back in, they, they, it would have tripped that and they would have known I had absconded with something from the precious archives of their basement. This was not on display. It's deep in the basement at the Natural History Museum. One bin over was the boy, the bubble baby, the bubble boys bubble, the kid that was uh, had immune thing and they put him in a bubble for 10 years. That was next over. And also there was R2-D2 was in the next thing over because right in the era just after the movie, they didn't have it on display yet, but it had been donated to the Smithsonian. So it's pretty cool being in the basement of the Smithsonian. I had to write um, just a little letter asking for permission to do it. I guess more it's more academics than some guy from an astronomy club up in Massachusetts to come down there. But they were very nice. Uh, Deborah Jean Warner has written a lot of astronomy books, contacted me right away. She, she gave me a couple of dates and times and we arranged it. And I had a grad student with me the whole time. I think I got a picture of him. He actually set the thing up for me. Now, I mentioned the slow motion controls. So you see, you know, this, this is just little pivot points made out of the brass that Holcomb made. But here, um, there's a rope that goes down a pulley and it loops onto this thing. So you could actually turn and raise and lower these legs while you're looking in the eyepiece with the back end on that little um, spike and wheel. And you could actually track an object a little bit. It had to be pretty crude, but I thought it was pretty ingenious that Holcomb had come up with this stuff. I've never seen anybody else, any other telescopes. Herschel certainly didn't do that. We saw the other picture. So I, I think Holcomb came up with the design all by himself. Um, at the time I, I had my Coulter Dobsonian. I had met John Dobson a couple of times. And this is something I think Dobson would have really appreciated, you know, this kind of telescope. It's something you could, an amateur could take out and use. It just, it just felt good. Um, surprisingly simple, solid ropes and pulleys for tracking. And he was pretty successful with it. Uh, three times he made the largest telescope in North America. He made a six and then he made an eight and he finally made a 10 inch. Um, He took one of the telescopes. He got um, told. Took took one of the telescopes down to Yale. Professor Silliman, who was one of the big astronomers of the 1830s, told him, "Hey, it looks pretty good. It compared to the European refractors that Silliman was using." He said, "You should take it to the Franklin Institution in Philadelphia, and um, have them do a full analysis on it." And they actually did that. And somewhere in my laptop bag, I, I have uh, have the notes. And they actually awarded him a gold medal. And they, they talked about in details of the double stars it was splitting. And they said his, uh, I think it was an eight inch that he brought down um, in a mule cart down to Philadelphia. Um, New Haven is about a 55 mile or 60 miles down the old canal from Southwick. But uh, Philadelphia would have been another 120 miles. So it's almost 200 miles that Holcomb went down to Philadelphia brought on his um, eight inch telescope and they did an evaluation and wrote it up and raved about the thing and it awarded him a gold medal. Now, I think there's a sad story around the gold medal. Um, I actually met the great, 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 great granddaughter and she showed me the gold medal. She showed, probably showed me the gold medal. And I kind of tried to convince her to donate it to the Southwick Historical Society. I even said, you know, I'm sure they will pay you market price for the gold medal. And she had this look in her eye that told me she was going to take it to the gold trader and, uh, you know, cash it out, I think. So it's never been seen by anybody again. The historical side, people in Southwick that know that stuff have not seen the gold medals. So I might be the last person outside that family member that saw the Franklin Institute gold medal. So he sold these Herschelian design telescopes to prep schools, universities, and just amateur astronomers pretty much throughout North America, at least Eastern North America, into Canada, down to Georgia, um, out as far as uh, Wisconsin, 
notes of his telescopes being sold. It wasn't thousands of them, but it was certainly scores of them. Maybe in total, it was 80 telescopes that he sold in his lifetime. Um, but I, I've got uh, two pieces to read. Practical Astronomy in 1841. I guess you, you didn't subscribe to Sky and Telescope. You subscribed to Practical Astronomy in 1841. And the review said, chief recommendation is this telescope is that with an excellent figure in the speculum, which enables it to compete with the telescopes of the best European artists in performance. It affords a comparatively modest price, a cost of a foreign instrument of equal power and light bearing two or three times greater. So you're, you're getting it for half price or a third of what you were getting a six inch something, or probably a four inch refractor from, uh, from France or England at the time. So, um, Holcomb's telescopes were listed. Now, I don't know if this is just the mirror and the lens or a finished telescope. They were listed from $100 to $600 for a four inch, eight inch or six or 10 inch. And they didn't really talk about them as being a four inch or a six inch or 10 inch. They talked about being a five foot, an eight foot or a 10 foot telescope, but we all know what that means, right? So um, a 14 foot was the, the big one. Um, this is the first observatory built at an American college. It is Williams College Observatory. It, it still exists in um, Williamstown, Massachusetts, which is the very corner up where New York, Vermont, Massachusetts come together. Really beautiful college town up there. Um, they wouldn't let me in. And I think it's used as a storage room now. But this is the first observatory in the United States at a college. And their primary instrument was a Holcomb eight inch Herschelian. So I thought that was pretty cool. And their official, um, their official history written in the 1950s said it was a eight inch Herschelian imported from England. And I got uh, Holcomb's um, from the great, great, great granddaughter. I, I had his log and I saw right, right at the time this opened, you know, eight inch or 12 foot telescope sold to Williams College. So they were wrong. They assumed it came from Europe when they wrote in the fifties, but it really, really wasn't. Um, one more thing to read, it's from an, um, I, I think it's a novel, although it might have been a memoir. And it's a book called The Great Locomotive Chase that was written in William, by William Rittinger in 1863. And the premise of it is it's, a, it's, a, it's probably somebody with post-traumatic stress syndrome coming out of the Civil War. And he's discharged and goes back to his farm. And the, the, the line is, but the first money obtained after paying for clothing was diverted to securing a telescope. I couldn't afford to purchase a large one and I was not satisfied with a small one. I bought the mirror and eyepiece for a 10 foot reflector from Emma Holcomb of Massachusetts. It possessed power and showed clearly all the objects commonly described in the astronomy works. Here on a spot above the farmhouse, many happy nights were spent and neighbors frequently joined in gazing at the wonders of the sky. Beautiful amateur thing. And I, you know, relate to that, taking the scope up, you know, behind a farm in Southwick, doing programs and sharing it, just having a wonderful night, seeing all the, all the spectacular objects listed in the, the, the guidebooks. You know, M13, look at it. You can see stars. Um, so this is the farmhouse where he lived most of his life. Um, it still exists, no one lives in it. Um, it's kind of fallen in the disrepair a little bit. Around the back is a farm stand and bakery. So all summer long you can buy corn and squash and whatever and you can get best pies in the town are from the Holcomb property. Um, so it still exists. And um, I went in there, 
probably 25 years ago. And I said, hey, you know, this is the old Holcomb. And, and the owner knew all about it. Oh, yeah, he did that. But since then, I don't know if the people that run it are aware of the connection to history they have. Now, his, his workshop is right here. That's where he made the telescopes. And the story is from right about where I have the laser pointer pointing south down the highway, there's the Methodist church is a half a mile away. And you can still stand there and you can see the Methodist church. And what he wrote in his little bio is that he worked the mirror until he could read the 23rd Psalm that was written on the steeple of the Methodist church. And I thought, hey, that's a great story. You know, you do it, you figure it, you get it right. When you can read the 23rd Psalms sharply that, you know, you nailed on. And I told that to the president of the Suffolk Historical Society. He said, hmm, interesting. I said, what do you mean interesting? He says, well, he said, from all the notes we have, the steeple wasn't built until 1880. I'm like, well, you know, maybe he was, I don't know. I, I don't know what the story was that, but it's a great story and I'm, I'm gonna believe it. It's an aerial picture, uh, beautiful Southwick, Massachusetts. Um, this is actually my friend's farm. Amos's farm would be right about here in this, right about in there somewhere. Um, he made telescopes. He was the king of telescope sales, 1830s into the early 1840s. Uh, he had many other interests. He had a thriving surveying business. He was a civil engineer and they were putting the canal through. They were put, the New Haven to Northampton Canal uh, was being put in after the success of the Erie Canal. It was gonna open up Western Massachusetts you know, and make Massachusetts get, get around those infield rapids and, and make Western Massachusetts a booming metropolis. Um, he had this business sense to not invest. He was one of the wealthier guys in town, but he took their money to do the surveying and the civil engineering. And he knew the soils were sandy. Um, he, he knew there were problems with water flow with, with too little water in the summer and then floods in the spring. Uh, so he stayed clear and the canal got finished and was only in operation for about five or six years when the railroad went in along the Connecticut River the, um, and, and undercut the canal. And the canal was never profitable. Although we still have shreds of the canal structure are still there. Well, my wife and I bike ride, uh, we ride along the old canal. Um, and he moved on to many other things. He did uh, more teaching. Um, he served several terms in the Massachusetts legislature and most prominently, he became a circuit riding uh, minister in the Methodist church. Um, he would go anywhere from New Haven to Boston. He, he, he would kind of have his route over a couple of months and he, he made good money coming in and you know, by his poem and his fire and brimstone and his intellect, I'm sure he was an interesting guy to bring into your church to, you know, every couple of months. He was a trustee of Wesleyan University and he was tinkering with daguerreotype photography. And he makes a claim because he could make his own optics and glass. He makes the claim that he is the first one to take life in a, in, in a daguerreotype. In other words, do a portrait of somebody. And, and I, I, you know, I, I had it and I, I had it at the thing and I pointed out to Deborah Jean Warner when I was at the Smithsonian. And she said, yeah, about nine people have made that same claim. So she said, it's not that they weren't, but independently, anybody who had the chemistry of the daguerreotype and who enough, knew enough about lenses figured out that you could do not just uh, landscapes, but could actually do photography. Um, so in the early 1840s, some of the glass works started emerging um, on Cape Cod and, and then down in New York and eventually Corning, New York. And glass was getting fabricated in, in North America. You didn't have to import glass and you know wait six months or a year to get it from England. You could get it from Cape Cod or from New York. Um, and I think Holcomb got a little tired of the telescope business. He had more interest. 
And Henry Fitz started uh, his business in New York City making quality refractors. And um, Holcomb, I don't think he ever officially got out of the business, but I, I think he just kind of moved on to other things. Um, so he, he lived a good long life. He died in 18, um, was 1878, age 88. Um, and I think it's two things with, with his death. Um, one was in the almanac that he wrote when he was 18 years old, he wrote a poem, two easy things will satisfy mankind, an easy fortune and an easy mind. But one thing that gives a man content is a good conscience from a life well spent. And I have to think with all the things he did, serving in the legislature, being involved with his church, being a trustee at Wesleyan University, being involved with Williams College. Um, this guy lived a pretty, pretty long life, um, pretty productive life. He, um, you know, was a locally famous guy, but I, I think of him as, as almost a Ben Franklin. He, he, he was in this little obscure wilderness, uh, yet he kind of made his, made his mark on the world. And I dug up his obituary out of the Westfield newspaper. And I find it pretty interesting. On Saturday evening, Emma Holcomb, age 87, was found dead in the road not far from his residence. He had but a few moments before left the house of a neighbor in his usual health. Evidently, he was aware of his death was approaching and he laid down quietly in the snow and died without a struggle. Mr. H was formerly and for many years a Methodist preacher. Of late, he had given attention to scientific study particularly the study of astronomy. He was one of the older inhabitants, a man of marked intelligence and of considerable wealth. Um, so that's his obituary in the, in the Westfield paper. Now, as far as we know, there were no great discoveries ever made. You know, the planet Herschel was not discovered using a Holcomb telescope. Asteroids, you know, expanding universe was not discovered. However, Oh, um, this is his, his grave site, and um, he was a civil engineer and surveyor. He designed, it's a beautiful, our Southwick Town Cemetery is a really beautiful place, and he designed it. He laid it out and he picked out his stone right here. Um, however, he didn't, and no great discoveries with his telescopes. However, there was a traveling portrait painter from Ashfield, Massachusetts, named Alvin Clark. And because Amasa was one of the prominent figures in the area, Alvin Clark would, would stop by and, and see Holcomb when he was on his way to Hartford. Um, and Alvin Clark had a son, George Bassett Clark, who was at a prep school. And the prep school had an eight inch Holcomb telescope. And his son was fascinated with astronomy. And uh, Alvin Clark would talk, when, he, when he'd come through, he would talk with old Amasa, and he would pick his brain about how to grind glass and about speculum and the advantages of speculum reflectors versus the refractors. And Holcomb, in, in, in the transaction book, at the, the chart of accounts I had from Holcomb, uh, the sold glass, you know, like eight pieces of whatever or something to um, A. Clark of Ashfield. Um, so Alvin Clark, of course, went on to become really the premier telescope maker in the world in the, the late 19th century. And, you know, certainly Amasa influenced him in a couple of different ways. Um, so that's Alvin Clark and Sons, the, the family business. Um, and the other way that, you know, with the daguerreotypes and the work Holcomb did on that, I, I think Clark realized that portrait painters and oils were going to be out of business soon because photography did a better, cheaper job. Uh, but Clark went on and um, Massachusetts, Connecticut, that part of New England has long had a tradition of optical fabrication, um, certainly we have Clark telescopes. This, I, I, get, I get the joy of using this telescope, at least pre-COVID, uh, uh, pretty much any Saturday night I wanted to. This is the Amherst College Telescope, um, an 18-inch Clark refractor. 
And the Hubble Space Telescope um, was fabricated just down that college highway that, that M. Sahulcum um, took his ox cart to show Professor Silliman in Danbury, Connecticut. Hughes Optical, Hughes Danbury, um, fabricated the mirror for the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, if they had read the 23rd Psalm, <laughs> they never would have the spherical aberration problems. But um, I think it's no coincidence that Holcomb started that whole business. And even to this day, that telescope making uh, or um, optical engineering is, 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 is still pretty prominent in, in that New England Valley and then off to the Boston area. Well, I understand the, the web was fabricated in Alabama somewhere, wasn't it? Down the road uh, here, and it was assembled here in Huntsville. Is that so? I'm sure it could read the 23rd Psalm. For... Um, that's that's uh, that's all I have. Be happy to take questions. Anybody has any questions? I don't know. I I, I didn't look. I didn't see anything come on the uh, on the Zoom chat, but I might have missed something. Are there any other surviving open telescopes? Boy, that's my dream. Um, you know, I, I mean, my dream is someday to uh, be driving down the road and seeing some kind of a, a flea market thing and pull over and somebody's got this, yeah, well, this mess or yeah, something. It's, it's, uh, sales, yeah. You could uh, start to look through the ancestors. Yeah, I, I think the big problem is that speculum tarnishes so bad that, you know, eventually, it, it pretty quickly, it just looks like a piece of junk. Right. And the telescopes themselves, the tube of the one in the Smithsonian, it's common stovepipe. The, the tube itself is just common <laughs> stovepipe. So this thing doesn't look like anything of any value. And if somebody had it up in their attic, I'm sure it's just like, let's get rid of this junk. So it's very possible that some of those little surveying transit telescopes are around. And I'm not even sure that he put, you know, A. Holcomb on it or anything like that. They just look like, you know, generic brass, um, Transit surveyor scopes, I think. So, so you just have to know what it, what it was. Like if you saw it, you might know what it was, but most people would have no clue. Yeah, I mean, for me, the, the progression was once I got that um, that bulletin from the Smithsonian that, that he wrote, yeah. um, that was kind of when I started, okay, this, this, is, this is what he's doing. And then I started asking around town and, you know, Lee Hamburg, who's been the longtime president of the Historical Society in our town, knew a bit about him and about the family and some of the history. There's one, so he's a prominent guy and he was a wealthy guy and he was well-connected. He served in the legislature. He knew everybody in the state. Um, and there was an incident when he was in his late seventies, there was a tragic incident. His grandson came home and found his mother bludgeoned nearly to death, the bottom of the stairs. And they hauled her in and they, they got her conscious. It's her husband, it was Amos's son that beat the hell out of her. And the guy took off and law enforcement went to Amos and said, hey, you know, your son's almost murdered his wife. What do we, you know, and Amos, found the kid, he knew he was with relatives in Philadelphia, the story was, got him to come back and Amasa arranged for uh, the police to uh, take him into custody and got him the best lawyer in Massachusetts and got him off with, um, wasn't an attempted murder or anything like that. I got him off with, a, um, you know, like it's just assault and battery charge. The, guy, the, the son did six months in jail, got out, and the governor pardoned the son after that. So it was expunged from the record. So Amasa had clout and used it as a tragic story. Um, the daughter-in-law died a few years later, maybe indirectly from the, from the beating. It was a sad, a sad story in, in the family, but showed the clout and respect that the guy had. That, you know, that they didn't go down to Philadelphia and lynch the guy. They brought him back, let him stay at the dad's farm and turn himself in. And yes. Yeah. So are you like the only person in the world who's studying this guy's life? I mean, this sounds, sounds really interesting. 
but uh, it also, from some of the comments you've made, it almost sounds like nobody really is doing this but you. Are you going to write the book on Amasa Holcomb, or is there anybody else out there doing this? Or So at Stella Fane, a couple of years ago, I got cornered by a guy who lives down in Connecticut that told me he wanted to write a book. He was going to write a book on Amasa Holcomb and that Wilman Bell was going to publish it. Wilman Bell retired, and I don't even know if they got picked up by they anybody, did. but they, you know, astronomy, yeah. the Campbell's van of the astronomy publishing. So as far as I know, the book never happened. I gave him information that I had. Now I have two advantages. One, I live in Southwick. I know the, I'm actually a member of the Southwick Historical Society. Um, Lee is a treasure trove of that and he lives across town. I, I see him a couple times a year. And uh, I'm an amateur astronomer, so I kind of understand, you know, the history with Alvin Clark. I get to use an Alvin Clark telescope all the time. So I, I, I kind of have access to the history, know the history, and also know the kind of the astronomy and the connection side. I don't think that's unique. This guy that was writing a book knew some things I didn't know, but he, he I, I was also able to give him a lot of information that he didn't have. Like go into the Beinecke Library. The only reason I knew the almanac was there because my buddy Lee said, oh yeah, there's, he, he wrote two almanacs uh, when he was 18 and 19 and there's only one known copy and it's at the Beinecke at Yale. Was, okay, that's a no brainer, I'll go, go there. I knew the telescope was in the Smithsonian, you know, take my kids to the Smithsonian is a no brainer for me. So we, we did that research. So I don't know if anybody's had that combination of, access and interest to do that so it's sort of the perfect storm of all these these different things coming together to to be the guy so there's a there's a um a, a, a club called the antique telescope society bart freed is the long time president and every time i see bart he kind of corners me and wants me to do more and write stuff up and document and I'm retired now. I don't have the same excuses I had, but I mean, people like Bart are aware of Holcomb and are aware of his relationship and impact on Fitz and um, the Clarks and you know other other people doing the work and how how that evolved. But yeah, I mean, I, I'm the local guy. That's that's I'm the local guy who also likes telescopes. So right. That makes me a little bit unique, I think. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. This was a thrill for me to come, come, come do this talk. Um, yeah. yeah. Really yeah. Thanks. I never even heard of it. Uh, I have a question. Are there any questions from Zoom? Um, I don't think. I, no, I think we're good. I have a question. Well, thank you very much, Ed, for coming and share and giving this talk. I had never even heard of this man before, but he seems to be incredibly influential for multiple, multiple people that uh, went on to do quite a lot. Um, Tim, so this, I think you have to send a text uh, message. The recording? Can I just ask one more question? Oh, yeah, Don, go for it. Um, and it probably this should be on the recording, too. So yeah. just, why I why cut you off there. Um, did I understand that he was influential in the Alvin Clark family getting involved in, in telescope manufacturing? Uh, in a couple of ways, yeah. I mean, the, the first way was the family interest was through the son, George Bassett, being at the prep school that had a Clark, had a, a Holcomb Herschelian um, reflector, got the family interested. And the second thing is, yeah, Alvin Clark and Amos Holcomb were buddies. Right. Ashfield, Massachusetts. Clark made the telescopes in Cambridge, the Boston area, but he did his painting in um, Western Massachusetts, up up in the hills, not far from Southwick. So he would travel to Springfield, he would travel to Hartford, he would travel to Boston and get commissions to do portrait painting. And when he would travel through, directly on the route to Hartford, came through Southwick, Massachusetts, and Holcomb is right on the main road there. He would stop in and chat with his buddy Amasa and talk talk stargazing and talk about telescope construction. So definitely, definitely Holcomb had influences 
And also, I'm sure Holcomb told them, hey, you know, this daguerreotype stuff's coming. Uh, no one's going to be buying your oil portraits uh, anymore. <laughs> Much longer. So, of course, it was I, black and white, not color, but still. <laughs> cool sepia colors. Close I, enough. Close um, enough. I, I wondered if that picture of the old Amasa, you know, that old sour old picture uh, was a self-portrait. I wonder it if it probably was. was. I, I wouldn't be surprised if it was. Yeah. He seemed pretty self-made for the most part, other than the uncle starting off. I two two more things I can add. Okay. Um, one is I, I got to read one of his sermons, a handwritten sermon in beautiful penmanship. And it was the typical fire and brimstone, but he had some he had some stuff in there that kind of kind of was a little funny, you know, it was just you know, like a little off in the next thing. And then in the 19, uh, the 1809, he had jokes. Yeah. He had jokes throughout, you know, and, and he didn't do that in the first one, but he did it in the second one. And his jokes aren't funny at all, you know, but it's like, <laughs> it's from like two centuries ago, you know, it, it's some, it loses something in translation. And I, I remember two of the jokes. One was um, the prisoner was being hauled away to jail and the judge asked him if he had any remorse. And the prisoner said, oh, just one thing. I wish I had stole more money so I could afford a good lawyer. Not that bad. That was the better one. And then the second one was uh, something to the effect of uh, a friend asked me if he should have his daughters study Greek and Latin. And I told them, one tongue seems to be more than enough for a woman. Oh, my God. <laughs> wow, boy. So those were the days. Yeah. Those were the days. And on that note, I'm going to go ahead and close the meeting out. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Uh, and once again, thank you very much, Ed. That was fantastic. OK, closing it out. I'll be Closing back when it's clear to do some observing. I know, right? Hopefully. Oh, we actually got one question. At f15 and a reflect reflectivity of 60%, was Holcomb telescopes limited to planets and the moon? Oh no, no, he he would. Uh, he, he, you could say the Messier objects. Any of the Messier objects before the mirror tarnished. He, yeah, that they would be the the big thing for him was. Uh, um, he, he would talk about seeing uh, the clusters or, or the nebula. So no, that, it's not just the, the planet, the moon. He, he was certainly with an eight inch, um, yeah, he, and, and very dark skies of, you know, 1830, he, he was certainly doing the Messier objects. And, nice. and you know, because he was a Herschel fan, I went down if he did like the Herschel 400 too. <laughs> he probably did. Well, thank you for that, Tim. And we're going to close out the recording. Stop the recording. Who was that first joke again? The, the first one was about the prisoner being led away and the judge 